Hi, this is uh, Dr. Ravi Krishnan. I'm a neonatologist at St. Mary's NICU. I'm the medical director of the NICU, as well as the chief of pediatrics. I'm here to answer questions for you nursing students. What is a NICU, Neonatal Intensive Care Unit? It's very important. A neonate deals with the first 28 days of a baby's life. A perinate is 28 weeks to the first seven days of life. And we take care of babies in the neonatal intensive care unit and 60 to 70% of our admissions are cardiorespiratory problems. There are different levels of neonatal care, a level one to a level four. And a level one is where there's a delivery service, babies are stabilized if they are sick enough and transported out. A level two is a center that has a nursery and can do different levels of care. Level three is a higher level and level four is in a regional university setting. So as long as you understand there are different levels of neonatal care, and in California, the levels are a little different. They have community hospitals like ours, and they have regional centers. If I'm classifying the babies as based on not gestational age, but birth weight, a baby less than 2,500 grams or less would be called a low birth weight baby. A baby less than 1,500 grams will be called very low birth weight babies. A baby less than 1,000 grams, which is equivalent to 28 to 29 weeks, will be called ELBW babies, extremely low birth weight. And a baby less than 750 grams will be called incredibly low birth weight babies, ILBW, or fetal infants. So that is the categorization of based on birth weight. Good morning, students. My name is Hassana. I'm one of the day shift team leaders and we welcome you to our unit. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about hand hygiene and the importance of hand hygiene in the NICU. <clears throat> our babies are very um, delicate populations, so hand hygiene is very important. So when you first come into our unit, first of all, you have to make sure you don't have any jewelry on, uh, no watch, no rings um, on your hands. Um, and then you have to do a three minute scrub. This is our scrub sink. This is our scrub brush cabinet right here. You get a scrub brush and there's soap in it. You just get it wet and you turn the timer on and the water is operated with your knee and you open it up and you put um, the soap on your arms and you use the brush and scrub for three minutes. Don't let the water running the whole three uh, minutes. And then there's a little blue plastic piece in here is to clean under your nails if they need to be cleaned. Once the three minutes are up, then you can uh, walk into the NICU and get your assignment. And then um, during your shift, if you have to leave the unit, if you stay in the maternal child department, meaning you don't go through any double doors, when you come back, you just have to do a nice hand wash or hand sanitizer. You don't have to scrub your hands again. But if you do leave the department to go to the lab or the cafeteria or your car, when you come back, we do have this thing right here. It's called Avagard and it's a pump you pump a little bit on the right hand and with your left hand you go like this 
and then you do the same thing with the left hand. You go like this and you rub your hands together and they dry. When you go into the unit, anytime you have to touch a baby, you have to do hand sanitizer before and after. Before you touch the baby and after you touch the baby, even if you're wearing gloves. This is our um, infant cardio respiratory monitor and every baby is on a monitor in the NICU. Um, the green number is the heart rate, the blue number is the oxygen saturation, and the white number is your uh, uh, baby's respirations. Um, just to let you know that um, the vital signs sometimes vary depending on the, what the baby's doing. If the baby is active, the, uh, the vital signs are gonna be all over the place and the monitor might alarm. Uh, just to let you know that we are always watching and listening. If the saturation is low, that doesn't mean the baby is really desaturating. Sometimes we have to look at the whole picture and then we assess and we uh, adjust accordingly. But just to let you know that we're always watching and listening and um, listening for alarms. Okay, also I want to talk a little bit about our visiting policy. Um, do you Due to COVID, our uh, visiting right now is limited to uh, one parent at a time. Before COVID, we were allowed two parents at a time, and then we were allowing grandparents, but right now it's only parents and one parent at a time. And um, everybody who comes in, the parents have to have a negative COVID test uh, within 24 to 72 hours, depending on which test they're taking. Um, so we do try to limit our visiting and our, uh, the number of people in the unit as much as possible. And also, if you guys are not feeling well, when you come to your clinicals, please uh, let your instructor know and uh, let us know so we can uh, uh, try to figure something out for you. Hi, Dr. Ravi. What do you think is the most important thing for students and nurses for their clinical rotation? As an introduction to your nursing rotations, I really feel that a few things are important that you're going to take it through your entire career. Let me start with remembering names, because that's so critical. When you come into a rotation, identify your team, get to know the names of uh, people, because you don't always want to be called as he or hey. You just want to be called by your name and that's respectful, that gives dignity and it's important and it connects with people. Without teamwork, it doesn't make the dream work, doesn't it? So let's work as a team and all of us are doing whatever it takes in the care of the baby. And when I say teamwork, the teamwork involves the family, particularly the parents of the baby. We are, believe, believe it or not, we are caretakers. And the parents should be part of our care plan. Then comes communication. Communication is the key. And communicating with all members of the team helps in better outcomes and providing the best care possible. And there's no misunderstandings when that happens effectively. Let's talk about the chain of command. Many of our nursing students, including nursing staff and physicians, we need to know the chain of command. If you're not able to answer or do things effectively and you need help, be sure to ask your preceptor. Be sure to ask the TLC or go to the manager or the medical director or the neonatologist 
So the chain of command in every unit is important for you to know. When you come for any rotation, you have to prepare for it. Preparation is half the battle won. And when you prepare for a rotation, and now you have Google, you have various devices, you could ask your friends about the rotation. All of this is very helpful in knowing what to expect for the day. You have to be compulsive, especially in an intensive care unit like ours. It's not enough just to order tests. It's very important that you follow up, get the result, get it interpreted, and then provide the care that the baby needs. So the cycle is never complete without the final results and execution of action. And that's called a PDSA cycle, or plan, do, study, act and then it comes in cycles. And finally, I would say it's very, very important that you reflect on that day after you finish your rotation. Think of all the things that you have learned and how it's going to enhance your future career. Take time for yourself even if it's five minutes, to reflect on and go over things you have learned. Wishing you all the very best. One of the other things is documentation. Remember, if you don't document, it's as good as it never happened. So make sure that you document everything. And that would be very helpful five, 10 years down the road in case it becomes medical legal. You've lost your memory, but when you look at your documentation, at least it helps you to remember. Hi, my name is Miracle Figueroa. Uh, we made this video to walk you to our NICU to help you prepare for your clinical rotation. In our NICU, we take care of the most tiniest and sickest patient population. We are looking forward and having you, and it's our hope that you have a positive and depth and in depth learning experience. Let's talk about our hospital, St. Mary's Medical Center. We have about 125 to 150 deliveries a month. And between 275 to 325 admissions a year. We send critical babies where we are not able to provide care to our regional center. And I'm a children's hospital of Orange County doctor. And most of our transports go to our sister facilities at Pomona, at Chalk, sometimes Loma Linda, and other centers based on the equity of the baby and the needs of the family. We send about 30 to 40 transports a year out, and we take in about 70 transports from our other hospitals in the high desert area, Desert Valley Hospital and Victor Valley Hospital, and sometimes from Barstow. We also take care of babies that pediatricians send from their offices through the emergency room. Sometimes they are direct admits, like jaundice babies who need immediate intervention. Let's talk about, in general, let's talk about babies now, having given you all that information. What is a term baby? A term baby is any baby that's between 37 weeks and 41 weeks. 
anything over 41 weeks, 41 and 1 would be considered post-term. Any baby less than 37 weeks, 36 and 6 days would be considered preterm. The smallest at which a baby can survive seems to be 22 to 23 weeks, at which time the baby is anatomically, physiologically and biochemically ready to survive or built to survive. And the New York Task Force in the 90s looked at this situation. It's important to understand when we look at tiny babies, there's a such a thing called mortality and morbidity. When we talk about it, a baby of 23 weeks, we have to look at what is what percentage of these babies are capable of surviving. So you look at mortality and what percentage of babies survive intact. That's morbidity. Morbidity means handicaps. There are major handicaps and minor handicaps. Major handicaps are cerebral palsy, mental retardation, seizure disorder, blindness, deafness, and preterm chronic lung disease, including neurological sequelae. Minor problems are learning difficulty, behavior problems, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and academic deficits at school going age. So when we discuss any kind of prenatal consult, we talk to parents, we discuss morbidity and mortality, and percentages based on NICHD data, and our own institutional data. In prenatal consults, before the baby delivers, we also talk to the mother about what we call family-centered care. And family-centered care, we talk about lactation and breastfeeding and prepare the parents for it. And also talk about visitation times and what it really means for the parents to be there for their baby. Babies less than 37 weeks would be called preterm, but they are also categorized. Between 34 and 36 and 6 weeks, these babies are called late preterm infants. And late preterm infants they have their own set of problems, could be respiratory issues, temperature instability. They're not able to maintain their own body temperature. They may need an isolate, hypoglycemia, jaundice. Every baby gets jaundiced, more so the premature babies, sepsis. Chance of infection is high, especially if they're born premature and feeding issues. So these are the concerns we have for babies who are late premature infants between 34 weeks and 36 and 6 weeks. The chances of intact survival, survival without handicap, gets better from 25 weeks onwards. Below 25 weeks, it's the gray area. So. We do not talk about morbidity, um, we wait for the babies to evolve and the first week of life is going to be very critical and also prenatal care. If I'm classifying the babies as based on not gestational age but birth weight, a baby less than 2,500 grams or less would be called a low birth weight baby. A baby less than 1,500 grams will be called very low birth weight babies. 
a baby less than 1000 grams, which is equivalent to 28 to 29 weeks, will be called ELBW babies, extremely low birth weight. And a baby less than 750 grams will be called incredibly low birth weight babies, ILBW, or fetal infants. So that is the categorization of based on birth weight. So when we have a diagnosis for a baby, it's going to be a term, preterm or postterm, male or female sex, and appropriate small or large for gestational age. Now, how do we determine that? We look at a growth curve and we look at the gestational age and look at the curve for birth weight, for length and head circumference. If the baby for weight falls below the 10th percentile, because the normal is the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile. So any baby below the 10th percentile will be called as small for gestational age. Any baby above the 90th percentile will be called large for gestational age. And any baby between the 10th and the 90th percentile will be called appropriate for gestational age. And that is important to understand. And the concepts of IUGR, intrauterine growth retardation versus small for gestational age, which we assess after birth. When a baby is born, most of you would have seen that there's an assignment of what we call the APGAR score. Now, this was done by Virginia APGAR, and the history is that she was a professor of anesthesiology at Columbia University in the 1950s. And the initial APGAR score was given at one minute. And remember, APGAR scores just tell you the condition of the baby at the time of birth. It does not indicate the need for resuscitation. Because by the time you give an APGAR score of at one minute, you would have failed in your resuscitation attempts, which should start soon after the baby's birth. And APGAR scores are given at one minute and five minutes. And the APGAR scores range from zero to 10. And anything that's considered normal is seven or greater. So an APGAR score is given at one minute and five minutes and the extended APGAR goes, at, goes to 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and ends at 20 minutes till you reach an APGAR score of seven or till you reach 20 minutes, whichever is great. The best rating you get is of course IVF, in vitro fertilization, where you know almost the exact time of birth conception. Then comes the first trimester ultrasound. Beyond that, if a mother has no prenatal care and the baby delivers and you want to assess the gestational age of the baby approximately, we use some objective means and that's called the Ballard score. And the Ballard score goes as low as 20-22 weeks and it's normed for that population of the US. And when in doubt, we do the APGAR score, uh, the Ballard score. And the Ballard score, you take it as, if it says it's 38 weeks, it could be 40 weeks or it could be 36 weeks. It could go one to two weeks either way. And that's important to remember. i like to mention briefly the problems of the preterm infant, the premature baby. Because 
a lot of our babies are born preterm. So when you look at it, it's all in three letter words, so it's kind of easy to remember. We can start with the brain. It's called IVH, PVH, PBL, intraventricular hemorrhage, periventricular hemorrhage, and periventricular leukomalacia. Then comes the eyes. We call it looking for ROP, retinopathy of prematurity. Then comes the connection between the heart and lungs. It's called a PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. Then it's of course premature lungs, what we call RDS, respiratory distress syndrome of the preterm infant. And when it becomes chronic, it's called BPD as the first stage, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And then you go on to preterm CLD, chronic lung disease. Next, we look at feeding issues and babies develop gangrene of the gut, what we call NEC, necrotizing enterocolitis and then comes babies become anemic what we call anemia of prematurity babies become apneic and forget to breathe what we call apnea of prematurity then we have NNJ neonatal jaundice and of course sepsis is a definite consideration minor problems of temperature instability and hypoglycemia and various other problems of the preterm infant. But the significant ones I'm, I've mentioned and we'll have our neonatologist discussing these topics with you. Probably two to three minutes of every topic so you have an idea of what we deal with in the preterm infant. I'm here to talk about another important aspect, what we call stabilization of the baby or resuscitation of the baby. And we do a program and every one of our nurses take that and it's called the NRP, Neonatal Resuscitation Program. It's like a, it's like a BCLS or a PALS, for pediatric patients, we do the NRP, Neonatal Resuscitation Program. The most critical aspects of a program like this is like a triangle. You have the heart in the center, you have the lungs on either side, and you have the brain sitting on top. This is what is critical for me when I go for stabilization of an infant in the delivery room or 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 anywhere else. The heart and lungs, they have to work together for a baby to survive. The brain sitting on top needs to be protected so it avoids future neurological consequences and sequelae. So when you talk about the heart and lungs working together, the most important thing is as soon as we enter the delivery room, in a baby, heart rate is critical. If it's below a certain heart rate, below 60 beats per minute, then resuscitation becomes even more active. And it all boils down to cardiac output. And cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate equals oxygenated blood, the cardiac output from the heart. Now stroke volume in babies, it's fixed. It's one teaspoon or five ml or less. And it does not follow the Frank Starling's mechanism of stretch of the myocardium causing more stroke volume 
which happens in an adult and the pediatric population. But in babies, you don't have that stretch. So it's almost fixed, the stroke volume. So the only way the baby increases cardiac output is by increasing the heart rate. And how do you increase the heart rate? You attack the lungs. You get the lungs to oxygenate and ventilate. And that's the goal. When you see the heart rate is dropping, we work on the lungs by providing breathing support or respiratory support. that you will um, hear in diagnosis is would be respiratory distress um, due to surfactant deficiency, fluid in the lungs, um, as well as hypoglycemia due to decreased brown fat um, and low um, insulin storage. You will also hear about hypobilirinia, which is jaundice, yellowish, um, yellowing of the skin, um, with increased red blood cells and destructions of the red blood cells. Um, other things that you will see um, is temperature instability. So they can be cold or too hot, and that can be due to well, from infection, um, and various things can affect the temperature as well. Um, other issues that you will see is um, feeding intolerance due to decreased gastric mobility. Um, infants are unable to coordinate their sex while in breathing. That doesn't de develop until about 34 weeks. Other things that you will hear is NAC, which is necrotitis intercolitis. Um, this is um, something that can develop due to different reasons, infection, um, decreased mobility to their tummy. So, you will see um, distended abdomen, you will see glutes, and you will learn about that in your clinical rotation more in depth. Um, Nerve-wise, the issues that you'll see is IVH, which is interverticular hemorrhage. Usually you'll see this with infants that are 32 weeks and under, so the less um, weeks in gestation that they are, they have a chi um, higher chance in developing this. You will also see um, terms like apnea, um, Apnea is when they kind of, they stop breathing for about 20 seconds or more. Um, you will see that the, um, that the doctor will order caffeine for these babies. So I mentioned um, some of the diagnoses and issues that you will see in our NICU. There are many more, but these are just some of the common ones that you will um, most likely see. So please, I encourage you to um, study up on them. Learn, my, um, learn the disease process, the pathophysiology, um, ask a lot of questions, be ready to answer questions. These are some of the common diagnoses that you will see. You'll see many, there are many more that you will come across. I encourage you to look up the ones that um, I mentioned and any other ones that come across to help to better prepare you for your clinical rotation. We are excited to have you here and we hope that you enjoy and we're welcoming you to our team. Hi, my name is Melanie. I'm a respiratory therapist. I have been a respiratory therapist for 11 years. I am trained in the NICU and I've been a NICU therapist for about 10 years. Um, NICU is my favorite part. Um, of being a respiratory therapist. I love being back here with the babies. Um, I love the NICU nurses, they're great. Um, they're very helpful. And it's just awesome to see um, even the smallest babies that we're able to bring back to life and see them go home. Um, so <clears throat> NICU is not for every RT. Some RTs do not like NICU because they're scared of the babies because they're too small. But then other people really have a heart for the babies and um, they really get involved. Um, there are lots of things to know about being in the NICU. Um, you always have to be ready because you never know what's going to walk in. A mom can walk in and be 22 weeks or be full term. Um, and anything could be wrong with the baby or the baby can be completely normal. Um, and sometimes you just don't know what to expect. But um, 
it's pretty exciting. I, lo I love doing it. Like I said, it's my heart. Um, so in the NICU, there are certain times where we have, which is called touch times. Um, and we also call them cluster times, which we coordinate with the nurse, um, where we go in and touch the baby at the same time. The reason why we do that is so the baby can save energy and not burn calories so that they can grow and also so we don't stress out the baby. Um, and then we, at that time, um, that's when we weigh and measure the baby. We listen to breast sounds, do our full assessment at that time. Um, and if we have any kind of blood gas or CBG that's due, we will also do that at that time. So I just want to show you some equipment. This baby right here is about 27 weeks. Um, we have our Neopuff, which is what we're going to resuscitate the baby with if we need to resuscitate. And then we have a double zero mask, which is the right fit for the baby. We just want to cover the nose and the mouth where it's not too big or too small. We have a two and a half ET tube with a stylet, and we have a double zero blade with a handle, and we have our entitled CO2, which is going to detect if our ET tube is in the right position. We have our stethoscope to listen for breast sounds and bowel sounds, and we also have our Metcalf, which we administer CuraSurf for preterm babies if they need it if they have not produced enough surfactant. So if they're requiring um, FiO2 greater than 40%, we usually administer it um, here. So this Neopuff right here, we can give CPAP. So we would just put it on the baby's face and it, we would set the pressure at five. And at 27 weeks, we usually start at 30% FiO2. And then we would go by the NRP guidelines for their um, stats. As long as the baby's holding their sats at 30%, then we just keep giving them CPAP as long as they're spontaneously breathing. And it helps open up their airways so they're not grunting. Um, if the baby is not breathing um, or is agonal breathing, then we can give positive pressure ventilation. We would set our pressure at 20 and our peep at 5. That's where we would start off at. And then we would occlude the top off and on, and that would give us their breaths and that would also help open up their airways and um, give them a positive pressure until they start spontaneously breathing and their um, oxygen levels start coming up. So this is our oscillator. It's a high frequency ventilator. Um, this we usually use on preterm babies and it's for lung protective strategies and also for newborn babies. Um, and it helps to protect their lungs. Um, so we have our map right here, which is our mean airway pressure, and our FiO2, and that's going to control our oxygenation. We have our amp and our hertz, which is our, our frequency, our rate, that's going to control our ventilation. So on the hertz, for every hertz, it's 60 breaths per minute, so it's pretty quick. Um, and it really does help protect the lungs because the breaths are so quick and um, there's less shearing in the lungs. Hi, my name is Faye, uh, an ICA nurse. I've been an ICA nurse for 20 years. Hi Faye, um, it's nice to meet you. It's good to have you here today. Um, we were wondering why do you think it's intimidating in the NICU? for parents and for students. Okay, um, for parents' uh, standpoint, uh, they perceive that NICU environment is a really intimidating place uh, because uh, once uh, we let the parents you know, sit at the bedside, all the alarms that's going off, uh, they perceive it as it's really intimidating, they don't know what to do. It's a, a strange place for them to see all of these monitors hanging and or and or or cables, you know, connecting to their baby. Um, and as much as they really want to help, whenever they hear those beeping sounds, 
they find themselves like helpless uh, because they don't know what to do. Uh, I think it's more of uh, needing uh, an education for them, um, get them involved in infant care, um, update them and explain to them every purpose of this, uh, of the tubes or wires or cables connected to their baby to allay their anxieties and fears. Okay, and um, how do NICU nurses help parents cope with being separated from their babies? That must be really hard. Oh yeah, um, there's so many ways um, that we can help the parents um, to cope up with uh, having a baby in the NICU. One is to encourage parents to participate or get involved in infant care. Uh, just like, you know, touching their babies, teach them on how to touch their babies like a firm touch for a small baby and checking the baby's temperature or diaper um, and also get them involved and also um, give them a frequent updates of what's going on with their babies. If the parents cannot come and visit the baby, encourage them to call frequently or at least every shift and get an update and also encourage the mom to pump um, so you know she can provide the breast milk and if it's possible for parents to hold the baby the baby i mean the baby stable enough for them to hold or the skin to skin encourage uh, those kind of um, um, gestures and to allay their anxieties and fears okay. and help them to cope up in the new environment. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Hannon. Um, I uh, have been a NICU nurse for 13 years now. I'm going to be talking about thermal regulation for uh, newborns and neonates. Um, we have here a uh, radiant warmer. So, you know, um, we're going to make sure anytime we admit a baby, um, we're going to prevent any kind of uh, thermal um, or hypothermia and things that could lead to potential respiratory uh, problems if you don't start with the thermal warming. So you want to make sure that the baby's heated. Um, you can turn on your heater. You can not just sit with the baby this way. So whenever in this mode, you uh, connect the um, uh, sensor which will have like a picture of a scale or the other one is a baby with like a little thermometer sign so you're going to hook it up in there or you could do that's if you wanted to do the baby one so you would hit it change it over to baby and then set your temperature typically you want maybe anywhere between 36.5 and 37 that's a good range for them to stay in um, so I'm going to set it up to 36.8 I'm going to hook up my baby and then that way it'll go off the baby's skin temperature. Now, if I don't want to go off the baby's skin temperature, if it's a newborn and you have to like clean it off, then I'm going to go with um, manual if it's not reading well. So you can go with manual, it, especially if you don't have like a sensor or anything and you want to turn it up, it'll beep at you anytime that it stays, I believe 20 and above for a long time, it'll beep at you every so often just to let you know that it, it you know, uh, it can overheat a baby easily so you just make sure that the baby's not getting too hot on manual mode um, so that's pretty much how a radiant heater works your heat's coming up from here your um, sensor which looks like this this part here you just want to make sure it reflects um, to the radiant warmer and that's how it picks up the heat on the skin um, now for a baby for premature, premature babies, you're gonna make sure to use um, for the uh, micro preemies or neonates, um, you're gonna use the wrap, and that's gonna be, you're gonna wrap the baby in that as soon as you can to keep the baby warm because they are not gonna be able to keep their body heat in a radiant warmer. You might have them in a radiant warmer initially just to place lines, 
and um, do all your initial like intubation and things like that, then as soon as you can, they will actually be in one of these guys. This is a giraffe and it's specifically designed for a um, micropreme or a premature baby that's anywhere between, we have them usually between 24, uh, ranging to 32. Um, the younger they are, you wanna make sure they get a, um, a giraffe. This top goes up. It has a, um, this is called humidification. And because neonates are, their skin is gelatinous, they don't have the adipose tissue, they are not able to keep their heat. So anytime you have a neonate, you're gonna make sure that they're on, um, or a premature baby, you're gonna make sure that they have the humidity. And typically we'll keep them on humidity until like they're 31 or 32 weeks, depending on if the doctor wants that. Um, so you're gonna make sure, anytime you go into the bed to take care of the baby, you wanna make sure that you get the air boost that basically keeps the heat in so that when your portholes are open and you're in with the baby, you don't let air out. Um, just with premature babies, you want to make sure anything you put into the isolate because of conduction, um, you warm it up before you put it in there um, so that the baby doesn't get cold from whatever item you're putting in. Heat up your IV fluids. Um, just try to keep that temperature up. If you have like a head ultrasound or if you have um, an echo or any of that, kind of procedures happening with the baby. Um, the only time you should pop that up or let the whole side down is if you maintain the heat of the baby. So you would have to have a lot of warm blankets and it has to be um, absolutely necessary. Otherwise, just use the portholes. I don't care how uncomfortable it is for the head ultrasound tech. Um, just they have to have the portholes and you have to work through the portholes. Um, anything else I missed? Um, what happens, why is it so important to keep babies uh, within a certain range? Like what happens to them when they're hypothermic and what happens to them when they're hyperthermic? So with hypothermia, um, just think of the circulation, right? So um, your circulation is not going to be flowing, you're gonna, everything's going to slow down, their perfusion is not going to be um, at its optimal so if it's not optimal um you have things like they're going to end up going into respiratory um uh, distress or um, they can end up uh going into some cardiac um rhythms or any um so you just think about circulation so your heart is going to be not pumping as much or if it is pumping it's not going to the um you can end up in um, uh, metabolic metabolic uh, acidosis. Um, you can have it. it um, you can have metabolic acidosis. You can have um, from the metabolic acidosis. It could be kidneys. It will lead to the lungs. Um, the lungs it would end up like you can uh, increase the PDA. You could. Um, <laughs> then you have apnea you could, and you could have yeah so respirations would kind of go down um baby could stop breathing um and then you would have to intubate like if they don't transition and that pda is gonna like increase because you have um, hypertension of the uh, pulmonary hypertension that can cause them to um if, if they don't transition well you can push them into pulmonary hypertension and then that can cause um respiratory distress and even failure. Um, so a lot of babies, especially like a newborn baby, if he doesn't, if, if they have cold stress, it's called cold, cold stress, um, it can lead to that, those kind of things. Um, so it's one thing to, that you can make sure doesn't lead to something else is just keep them warm. And what about if they're too warm? If they're too warm, you wanna cool them down, not, um, Suddenly, just because like you have, you can have a febrile seizure if you bring them up warm too fast, and you can also have if you bring them down too fast, you can also have seizures or um, things like that. So you don't want to bring them down too fast. Um, if what you want to do is bring them down about a half, uh, um, 
a, what is it called, a degree, half a degree at a time, um, maybe in over a period of a half an hour. Um, so you don't wanna like just, they're 38 and you bring them down to 37 within 10 minutes. You know, like just gradually bring them down, gradually bring them up or apply heat. You can't really heat them up too fast unless you are, you know, if they're under a radiant warmer and they're really hot, they can get really irritated. They can have tachycardia. They can um, have seizures. Um, so that's why you don't want to keep them too warm. You don't want to keep them too cold because of the cold stress and you'll end up in respiratory distress and things like that. So it's important to kind of keep them in a happy medium, which is the 36.5 to 37. All right, my name is Krista. I have been in NICU for the past five years and I've been a nurse for almost 25 years. Hi, Krista. I was wondering why can't the babies in the NICU be held and loved on all the time? So babies in the NICU are here because they have something going on with them. Either they're premature or they have um, underlying problems. So we do what we call touch time, which means that we go into their space every three hours and do all their cares. And the reason for that is that they're preemie, they need to grow. Um, their jobs are to eat, sleep, pee, and poop, and grow. So we don't want to interrupt that by causing them extra stress and making their bodies need to burn more calories by having them out at their um, regulated temperature area, which is their isolate, and causing them to lose weight because we're trying to maintain their temperature. Also, um, with the feeding, we don't want to overstimulate them so that their guts get all screwed up and stressed out and then they don't become mobile. So we want everything to go smooth and go. So that's why you limit the feeding? Yes, we limit the feeding because their tummies are only the size of their fist. So we don't want to feed, feed, feed. Babies will, um, if they're happy or sad, tired or awake, they will always suck, suck, swallow. And little babies, um, the premature ones, they don't, under 34 weeks, they don't have the tendency to be able to suck, swallow, and breathe all at the same time. So we use the NG tubes to help them with that. And then when they are able to suck, swallow, and breathe, then we start giving them the nipple, but we don't want them to tire out. Um, same with the bigger kids. The NG tubes originally are usually, um, if they're having respiratory issues, to help um, burp them or take the air out of their tummy while they're on um, breathing machines for them. And then they um, use the NG tubes to slowly introduce feeds to make sure that their gut stays mobile and um, that they can tolerate it. And they start having problems um, gagging or with their gastric juices that we can able to pull it out. Thank you so much. Hi, my name's Teresa. I've been in the NICU for 24 years. I've been a registered nurse for over 30. And I just wanted to bring the uh, reality of why delay cord camping is so important for babies. Um, the main factor is that one third of baby's blood is left within the placenta. So if we immediate cut and clamp, that baby's gonna have lower blood volumes, which can possibly lead to some medical deficits, including uh, oxygenation. So one of the things that's been more prevalent within the last 10 years is the delayed cord clamping by NRP. And NRP suggests up to 60 minutes, 60, I'm sorry, 60 seconds of life. Um, especially for preterm, it's definitely 60 seconds. A term can go 45 seconds or more. And it depends on what parents wish as well. Um, the physicians, we do sometimes have a hard time with the OB staff getting on board, but we are working our way there. So we just have to kindly remind them when we're either in a section or in a delivery, as long as baby's okay, is to provide delayed cord clamping, either for 
45 seconds or 60 seconds or longer to ensure that that baby gets the blood that he, he or she is supposed to get. Um, the benefits in increasing blood volume is a decrease for blood transfusion, increase in iron load, and a decrease in intraventricular hemorrhage in these infants. Um, all babies qualify with the exception of babies that are down, um, floppy, non-responsive, and need emergency care at the time of delivery. Um, multiple gestations, uh, as long as we do not have a problem with um, again, the delivery and the baby is, is fine when he comes out, moving, crying, or acting vigorous. Emergent deliveries are contraindicated, as I stated. Fetal intolerance to labor, um, if the placenta had an abruption or there was an accident and some type of hemorrhage, you're not going to want to do the delay because it can be taken actually, we can lose baby's blood towards the placental and maternal side. Um, previa, um, active maternal seizures, again, it's contraindicated. A tight nuchal cord, um, if, again, if the baby is not vigorous at birth, that's something that we're not gonna do. If the baby has high drops and any underlying causes, um, you don't wanna do delayed cord clamping as well and a twin to twin transfusion. So if you have the large baby and the small baby, the really small baby, you don't wanna do that delayed cord clamping because of the um, transfusion issue there. Um, malformations like a myelinchocele, congenital heart defect, um, diaphragmatic hernia, or um, some type of gastroschisis, another reason you would probably delay on the cord clamp, not do delayed cord clamping. Um, again, term infants, we try to, you know, see if we can do 60 seconds, but if not, uh, 45 seconds is sufficient and preterm infants, definitely a minute. Preterm um, infants, we just supply the babies with warm blankets, you know, during the delivery and hold below the mother's um, incision. A lot of doctors will hold them up in the air and that doesn't benefit because it's a hard time for the gravity for the blood to flow uphill. Uh, let's see. If we have to use a needle wrap for a preterm baby, again, as long as the baby's sufficient. So the biggest point here is to know that one third of baby's blood is left in the placental side. So there is a very important reason to have delayed cord clamping. Well, would we want to do cord milking then? No, we don't want to do cord milking. That has a tendency to break the cord or break the um, blood cells within the cord and can increase in a higher jaundice level as well. So you want the baby to get whole blood cells. So we don't want to do cord milking is not suggested per NRP guidelines. Also, can it cause um, IVH? Yes, the pressure can cause what Julie was saying is IVH or is the interventricular hemorrhage. And if you have a preemie baby and sometimes even late preterm babies, you can cause that pressure within the um, feedback system and it can cause a brain bleed and we don't want that. Thank you, Teresa. You're welcome. Have a blessed day. Hi. My name's Sam. I'm a nurse here at the NICU at St. Mary's. I've been here for 13 and a half years. And I'm going to talk to you about discharge preparation. Okay, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about discharge preparation, Sam? Um, I think about the checklist of things that babies all need in order to go home. Um, every baby obviously needs to have their newborn screen done. Uh, we have to check to make sure the hepatitis B vaccine was given, and if not, a refusal was signed. Um, for any baby 37 weeks and less has to absolutely have a car seat test done for prior to discharge. Uh, let's see, we have to have a CCHD done. And if that doesn't pass, then we have to do make sure there's an echo done. And we also have to have a uh, CPR and choking done, a video that the parents have to watch. And then we also do a return demonstration with adults to make sure that they're semi-competent on 
sort of the basics of how to do emergency terpene and CPR just in case they ever need it. Um, they just have to be off oxygen, they have to be able to eat their feeds without a feeding tube, they have to be gaining weight, they have to maintain their temperature, and we have to make sure that the parents are competent and prepared to take their baby home. Okay, what about whenever it's a more complex discharge, like when the baby was very premature or had a lot of medical issues, kind of a complicated path? A uh, complicated, more involved discharge kids that have been here typically for a while um, involve outpatient services. Uh, high risk, uh, the high risk clinic down in Pomona and or La Melinda, depending on wherever the doctor chooses. Um, discharge summary has to make sure it gets sent over so they get followed up at six months post uh, NICU discharge. Uh, a lot of our babies have a follow-up um, eye exam if they ever qualified for one in the, the unit. Um, make sure the parent understands how absolutely important it is that they go to these appointments. Um, we have to definitely involve social workers, the case management uh, for any follow-up appointments for any specialty departments such as cardiology or GI or immunology or hematology or whatever it may be. Uh, all of those follow-up appointments are typically done through CHOP. So we have to contact the case manager so that they can facilitate insurance approval prior to discharge, hopefully early so you're not waiting on discharge date for stuff like that. Um, and then we also have to make sure that the all babies have to have a pediatrician review. So the number one question that everyone's going to be asked is, when is my baby going to go home? What day? How long is the baby going to be here? And you are never going to have that answer. Um, typically, we usually say ask the baby because the baby tells us when the baby is ready. Every baby is different. Nobody is on a set timeline. They all have to hit certain goals and milestones, and some babies do it quickly. Some people just um, go about the normal schedule, and then they go out when around the due date. And some just take a little bit longer. So it's never really a specific time. It's just a guess. That's it. What are some of the biggest hurdles that they need to are? milestones they need to accomplish in order to get home? Um, well, the babies have to be off of oxygen, number one, if they're on it. They have to be off of IV fluids and eating all of their food, um, and gaining weight and maintaining their temperature in an open crib without excessive blankets and stuff, making sure they're warm. Um, a roundabout weight is around 2,000 grams or four and a half pounds, but that's not necessarily specific as long as the baby's gaining weight we have discharge babies prior to hitting the 2,000 grams but as long as the parents have a car seat that fits the baby because some car seats are four pounds some are five pounds you have to make sure um, thank you you're welcome